Welcome to The Gary Null Show, a program designed to enhance mental, physical, and spiritual well-being through science and the wisdom of the ages. Let us take you on a journey of empowerment. Sit back, relax, and get ready to change your life for good. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Nall, and I'd like to welcome you to The Gary Nall Show, where each week this is the place to watch if you want to see the latest in self-empowerment, self-healing, and cutting-edge information. Today we have a very important topic. It'll be in several parts. It is the drugging of our children. Each day, millions of American children are waking up and forced to take a prescription drug because they've been given a diagnosis, ADD or ADHD. Is the diagnosis accurate? Are the drugs really helping people? Or has, as some claimed, psychiatry created a fictitious disease in order to help pharmaceutical companies sell drugs? Sound cynical? Sound implausible? Well, let's take a look. At this time, we do not have a diagnostic test for ADHD. Therefore, the validity of the disorder continues to be a problem. In 1998, the National Institute of Mental Health held what's called a Consensus Development Conference, in which the aim was to push the diagnosis of ADHD and to push the stimulant drugs. They had 30 experts come together to address an objective panel which would then give a consensus as to what the issues were. And the result was a consensus statement which said that ADHD was controversial, that it had no proven biological basis, that there was a risk of over-medicating our children, and that stimulant drugs have a lot of serious adverse effects. We do not have an independent diagnostic and valid test, such as a biological test or such as a blood test. I, I still want to get to the other part of the question, which is just a description of what you might yes. be looking for. Okay. But bef before you go on to that, it sounds a little bit like you're saying that the definition is a little like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography, which is you know it when you see it. <laughs> No, I, uh, I'm concerned. I, I, we're we're, we're going to disagree, and okay. uh, I would like uh, any member of the panel to describe uh, a typical ADHD in terms of symptomatology. Mark, would you like to? Since you see them in your practice, the, the, there. I mean, I think the, the panel has been frank, and you know the difficulties here are immense in terms of of. Uh, um, they were caught in a lie I mean, at the consensus conference. Uh, it is hard. It, it, it's very hard to know how to answer this question. These kids, uh, in in my experience, when you see these kids, um, they are, you know, several standard deviations different in terms of they cannot sit still, they cannot attend, their um, they cannot, you know, even when. Um, uh, they are as if driven by a motor. There are some good clinical descriptions um, of these kids. I think part of the problem is in the community, when you are a physician and somebody comes to you as a parent and says, my child might have attention deficit disorder, it's very difficult to know what to do and how much confirmation do you need. Do you need a, a teacher who also uh, who sees many kids and says, this kid is two standard deviations different from the other kids in my classroom. And the parent says, this kid is different. And he, it's, it's, um, um, and then, and then even if you say this child is different, you have immense problems with trying to say, why is this child different? Is this child being abused? Is this child uh, lead poisoned? Um, As of that, the consensus conference, they confessed they, they had no evidence that it was a disease. I think, you know, the, I don't think the panel is saying anything different, although we said it in more sophisticated ways, is the diagnosis is a mess. But there is, there is um, 
we all have a belief that we are dealing with a very serious core problem and that we have a diagnosis that allows us to communicate and gives us research, um, uh, generates uh, sort of ideas for research. And I think, you know, we, uh, I, I do, I think, the pro part of the problem is the profession keeps changing the diagnosis. We have DSM-4, the latest thing, but we have no, we have no guarantee that DSM-5 won't give us yet another diagnosis. We forced them under heavy questioning to admit that all the children who were showing up with brain abnormalities in fact had long drug histories, not just even stimulants, but a variety of different kinds of drugs. And we know from animal experiments that many psychiatric drugs, including the stimulants, can cause permanent changes in the brain. The belief system that psychiatry has these days is no longer has anything to do with scientific evidence. It's in, in the realm of religion. Nowhere in the uh, brain or body of uh, children said to have ADD or ADHD, uh, can an abnormality be found or has an abnormality ever been found uh, prior to their drugging? Uh, in other words, their drugging is the first abnormality. However, after the consensus conference was over and the panel had disbanded, the government simply rewrote it and came out with their own conclusions anyway. The NIMH is doing a lot of research now in the past several years using something called a um, functional MRI. Most people know what MRIs are. Using scans where they'll inject a certain kind of dye that will go to cells in the brain that use the most sugar, which is the main nutrient of brain cells, to find out where the most activity is during certain times. What they've discovered is that the areas of the brain dealing with decision-making, choices, solving problems, which are all affected by ADHD, are generally smaller in volume than that of normal children. The meanings and ramifications of this, I don't think are really appreciated yet. But it shows that there really is a significant and distinct uh, difference in the brains of children who have ADHD and those who don't. Without looking at the brain, it's guessing and uh, we feel very strongly, we actually have published research to the uh, effect that scans can help you with diagnosis and can help predict treatment response. We do a study in our clinics called Brain SPECT Imaging, S-P-E-C-T. SPECT looks at blood flow and activity patterns in the brain. It looks at how your brain works and what we see in a healthy brain is full, even, symmetrical activity and what we see in the ADD brain is that when people with ADD try to concentrate they get decreased or diminished or lower activity in the front part of their brain and then we target treatment to the specific brain you have so rather than one treatment fits everybody, we're going to target treatment to your brain. And, and we've done 25,000 scans over the last 14 years. It's not like I'm basing this on 50 people we've seen. People are different and they need different treatments, even if they come in presenting with the same problem. And one of the things that irritates me, upsets me, is psychiatrists are the only medical specialists that never look at the organ they treat when no other profession in medicine acts like we do, make diagnoses based on symptom clusters, prescribe powerful treatments that potentially could make you worse. Very often in my practice, I have patients come in and say, you know, you know, why don't you order an MRI scan for my child with ADHD? You know, I want to know if you can, you know, document or confirm that they have ADHD and there really is no test uh, that documents ADHD that's you know, clinically available. These are, these are research tools and by far and away the issue is not completely resolved. I mean, if we look at the brains of ADHD children uh, versus, you know, non-ADHD children, uh, there, if any difference there is, it's extremely subtle and uh, could be debated whether there's really a change there or not. So I think the issue is not resolved um, about whether we can say, ah, oh, this is an ADHD brain or this is not an ADHD brain. From 1990 
to the present time, researchers mainly at the National Institute of Mental Health have done brain scans on children with ADHD and have compared them to normal control groups. And this research has shown on average 10% brain atrophy or brain shrinkage. In all instances, uh, the researchers have concluded and have uh, stated in their conclusions and in abstracts and in press releases that ADHD was the cause of the brain atrophy, uh, making ADHD an actual brain disease. What they neglected to tell the public was that virtually all of the ADHD subject groups had been on long-term stimulant therapy and that the stimulants themselves, the Ritalin and amphetamines, were the likely cause of the brain atrophy. And so at no time has the scientific literature proven that ADHD is an actual disease, and at no time have they disproven that the drugs used to treat ADHD are themselves the cause of the brain atrophy. I had no idea that they would pursue me in Canada. Uh, we were pulled over by the RCMP. They checked my license and he said, are you aware that the FBI has two warrants out for your arrest? I said, no, I didn't. But they actually had a half a million dollar bounty out for me and my son. The U.S. authorities took my son back to California and they were going to try to charge me with two felonies, 10 years each. I spoke with a Canadian immigration officer who offered me political asylum. I stayed in Canada for three years, but I thought, no, I'm gonna go right back down there where my son is, back in the belly of the beast and fight it. That was my only way I was going to get my son returned. So I came back to Santa Clara County and I spent four months in jail many people all over the world wrote to the DA and the judge saying, why are you doing this to this woman and her child? And that support helped me to be released from jail. The school psychologist kept telling me that she believed Michael had another condition and it wasn't ADHD and that's maybe because the drugs weren't working. They never said that, well, it could be the drugs causing it. So the school sent me to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist, looking at the school documents once again, diagnosed him with social anxiety disorder based on the fact that the school documents said that he wasn't socially interacting and handed me a prescription for Paxil, which is an SSRI not even approved, FDA approved for children under 18. I'm concerned that we are not paying attention to what happens when children take Ritalin. Will it lead them to take more powerful medications like Paxil, Prozac? And if so, what happens when people take combination of medications? That is happening. In third grade, I was put on Paxil. And Paxil, that made me hallucinate and hear things, and I had like a voice in my head telling me to kill people. When Paxil was prescribed to Corey, we, we were unaware of the severe side effects. We had only been told about the side effects of nausea, vomiting, and headaches. When I first started taking medication, I felt pretty much the same, but as time went on, I felt more and more out of it, just not really feeling like things needed to be done, didn't really care. At the beginning, I was diagnosed with dysthymia by a therapist, though not by a psychiatrist, and then she suggested medication. The psychiatrist diagnosed me with depression, I guess severe depression at one point, and then um, I started taking Prozac. A serotonin reuptake inhibitor blocks a reuptake pump of serotonin itself, so it can't go back into the nerve that manufactured it and there's more and more serotonin in the space between the neurons. So there's a greater chance that the molecule of serotonin can wander across the synapse and hit a receptor site. Exactly how patients go from being depressed to undepressed is still a mystery. 
No one knows yet. But it's been fascinating because this is a very exciting time for brain chemistry and mental illness because we're starting to discover uh, things that really cure people like we've never had before. And we're starting to find out how the brain works. I did feel that I needed some kind of help. I had no idea what they would do for me. We are seeing new high numbers of kids who feel just sad. A lot of kids are living in a kind of pressure cooker right now. The expectations are that they should get the all their A's, become important members of various volunteer groups, to become an A soccer player, to fill in every moment of their lives with an activity that will show that they are a, an A achiever. But in fact, sometimes this backfires. The psychologist suggested that he needed medication. And we've had experience with medication with my wife and postpartum depression, so hey, we were just very at ease with this, and we took him to our family practitioner, and, and he suggested Paxil. He became violent. I almost like killed my friend because of his haircut. He literally flipped out over the fact that the boy next door had a haircut that he didn't like. When you look at the wide, widespread use of these mind-altering drugs among children is where you're going to find the answer for the violence that we're seeing in children today. After being on Paxil for about a year, I was changed to a different drug called Effexor, which is pretty similar. But the feelings I had were just, I was hardly ever there mentally. My mind was going everywhere, couldn't stay focused, couldn't think. I basically felt like I was just in the clouds all the time. According to my therapist, the Prozac was supposed to sort of give me a boost, get me out of the low place I was at. At first I was resistant to it, but she said that just because you're on it, you know, it doesn't have to be forever. That a lot of people take it and they just, they develop better habits. And you know, they're able to move on with life and eventually wean themselves off of it and not be depressed anymore. That's what it was supposed to do. He had no control. He came to me in the bathroom and he said to me, Mom, he goes, make it stop. I can't control myself. I don't know what I'm doing. Make it stop. We have a great amount of evidence in the scientific literature that antidepressants and stimulants cause abnormal behaviors in children, in particular out of control, aggressive behaviors. I thought I was going crazy. I was hallucinating, I was seeing things, I was hearing things. While I was on the medication, I felt like that was what was supposed to be going on. I had no idea what would happen to me, what other people would think, because I just, that's what I thought was the normal thing. What we've seen is depression is not one illness. It's at least six or seven different things. And if you give everybody the same medicine, give everybody, we call them SSRIs, medicines like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Lexapro, Celexa, you'll make some people better, no question about it. And you'll make other people worse. Um, so one treatment doesn't fit everybody. Understandably, what works for one patient might not be what works for another patient. You don't want to be too formulaic and in a cookie cutter kind of way, give the same thing to every person reflexively. It made me lose weight. I liked that. I had more energy. I liked that. I didn't feel as tired all the time. I didn't sleep as much. I went out more. I felt superficially better, I guess, in a sense, but not really, because it didn't really make my life better on a deep level, on an emotional level, just sort of superficially. He told us that he'd seen dark figures and heard voices while he was sitting in class at school. We also were found out through deposition by a friend of his that he had told her that he'd had a terrible, horrible nightmare about going into school with a gun, and this was a year before he actually went into school with a gun. There is a direct link and association between psychotropic drugs and violent behavior. As the archives of general psychiatry said in 1973, stimulants can cause impulsive murderous violence, such as we're seeing today with children going into schools and shooting their classmates and prayer groups. I remember getting the call to, you know, that Corey had come to school with a gun and I raced to school. And we spent some time with Corey in the principal's office. Corey was just a pile of sweat. I mean, he was sweating. He looked confused. He didn't know. He just had this look on his face of horror and scared and fear. In Dallas, we had two children on Paxil this summer. 
a boy 10 and a girl who just turned 15 who stabbed their six-year-old brother to death and buried him out back. Both kids on one of these drugs. We didn't know it was a drug because they were telling us, the psychiatrist, the school, they kept saying, you know, he needs to be on drugs, on these medications. And at one point I had the school psychologist saying he needs to be on medication to be in class. A majority of these children that have gone on shooting sprees, Conyers, Georgia, Paducah, Kentucky, Columbine, and Colorado, uh, these children were on psychotropic drugs. My name is Mark Taylor and I was shot at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. I believe that they did this because of the adverse reactions to the drug blue box. I am a medical expert in two cases surrounding the shootings in Columbine. So I have probably as much knowledge of what actually went on as any doctor does. And I can tell you that Eric Harris took Luvox on the day that he did the shootings, or perhaps the night before, because he had a normal effective level of Luvox in his blood on autopsy. I have seen the data. I was shot outside the school. Um, I was with five or six of my friends when it happened. And we were just sitting down talking. And uh, about 10 minutes later, I got a shotgun in my leg, hit me in the leg. And then the killer went over and shot Rachel Scott. And he came back and shot me five or six more times in the chest. And he threw two pipe bombs in the parking lot. And then he went downstairs and shot someone else and he proceeded on into the high school. I found a clinical study reported in the literature in which a child, while taking Prozac in a clinical trial, developed fantasies of murdering his classmates and being murdered by them. These fantasies and nightmares became so real that the child became confused about what reality was. I'm gonna pull out a goddamn shotgun and blow your damn head off! Do you understand? Prozac is closely related to Luvox. I was laying on the ground, and I was praying to God for him to someone to come help me because it took the police so long to get there. A half an hour later, a police car finally showed up, and he was providing me cover. And another police officer picked me up, and he put me in his car and took me to the triage. He saved my life. These are things that are discussed in the back pages of journals, periodicals, textbooks. And then when we see them uh, on the news, we're somehow told that, well, these kids were bullied. Uh, it's because of the way that they were brought up. It's because of they didn't have self-esteem or guns were readily available. The, the problem with that is we're not looking at what drove those children to pick up that gun, to decide that all of their classmates needed to be killed. And what we're seeing is a result of the administration of psychotropic drugs to children. In Bowling for Columbine, uh, we never really came up with the answer in terms of why this happened. I think we did a good job of exposing all the reasons that were given were a bunch of BS. You know, Marilyn Manson caused them to do it. This, this, or that caused them to do it. And none of it really made any sense. That's why I believe there should be an investigation in terms of what pharmaceuticals, prescribed pharmaceuticals, these kids were on. And, and perhaps uh, parents, it would have a shocking, um, it would just would be shocking, I think, to the millions of parents who prescribe this for their kids if they, if it was finally explained to them, if this is the case, that this perhaps occurred for no other reason other than because of these prescriptions. Imagine what that would do. Imagine how people would totally rethink things, grasping for every little straw they can to explain why something like Columbine happens, when in fact it may be nothing more than this. How else do you explain two otherwise decent kids, very smart, no history of violence to other kids in the school, why them? Why did this happen? It's an extremely legitimate question to pose, and it demands uh, an investigation. Well, the moment I woke up was really in a 
a cell of a of the juvenile detention center, and pretty much had a little tiny window to look out of. But I and just laid on the bed and. People were walking by, I could see people was terrified, didn't know what to say, didn't know who to call for. I've never had any amnesia symptoms before this happened. Eventually somebody, you know, asked me if I was all right and asked me if I knew why I was there. And they, they eventually told me. A few months after Corey was arrested and in detention, I happened to have a chance to talk to Clint, who's Corey's friend. And I asked Clint, I said, when Jamie asked Corey, are you gonna hurt us, what did Corey do? And Clint said he looked down at the gun like he was surprised it was there. And then he stopped and he was real quiet. We found out after Corey was arrested and it was a couple of weeks later, uh, Corey finally confided in one of the counselors that he'd been hallucinating. And he was seeing, the counselor called me at home and said, are you aware that Corey's been hallucinating? And I, I said, no, I, I'm not aware. And we just saw him Sunday. and. Uh, she says, well, he says he's been seeing tigers and bears and things in his room and outside his room. So that had me concerned because that was the first time I had been aware that these things can cause hallucinations. These kids can be in a, what they call a dream state. We're out of time. I'd like to thank you for watching. I look forward to sharing more on our next program.